Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Online Worship with Ramon Avenue Christian Church. I'm Dr. Matt and I want to welcome you to this time of worship and good news. And happy Mother's Day. Uh, happy Mother's Day to everyone, but of course, especially the mothers. Uh, adoptive mothers, biological mothers, chosen mothers, um, you know, mothers by choice, mothers by circumstance, all the mothering figures um, out there, second mothers, aunties, and so on, right? All these figures who come into our lives and express this thing we think of as motherhood, um, whoever that is for you. So um, I encourage you to take uh, some time, uh, especially today, but you know, take some time to Give thanks for the mothering figures in your life and think about who those might actually be beyond just your um, mother, the person maybe who raised you, who birthed you, um, but others in your life who have been that kind of presence. A few words about today's service. Uh, along those lines, uh, our special music today is a piece written by Wes um, for his mother, <laughs> who you'll see later. Um, it's called A Mother's Love, and uh, he wrote this a while back, and uh, we've put it to some images, um, images from various folks in our uh, church family, and uh, updated it uh, a bit. So, um, And then, as always, we'll be taking communion later in service, so if you want to find something to eat, something to drink, we'll partake together later in the service. Uh, one, one last thing I'll mention is you notice... The painting is back. Yes. Um, <laughs> we've we've uh, shifted the home office a bit, so I'm actually in a, a different room now. And so I, I uh, made sure to hang the picture so that you all could enjoy it um, during the service today. Um, plus, it looks better than just a bare wall. So um, with that, I invite us to come into a time of worship um, and let's sing together uh, the Lord's Prayer.
So church, on this Mother's Day, um, we come to our time of prayer and I can't help but think of mothers, uh, my own and those I know of many other people. Um, and so we want to pray for mothers today. And, uh, and to help us in that, I, I've found a prayer uh, by uh, Dr. Leah Sh uh, Shade, who's a professor at uh, Lexington Theological Seminary which is one of the disciples seminaries, although she herself is a pastor in the uh, ELCA, uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Um, the prayer will take us into all kinds of aspects of motherhood. And I think it's worth remembering uh, the diverse experiences and the diverse lives that, that bring people to mothering. Um, and that we see mothers uh, dealing with. So um, now, of course, there are other concerns on our hearts and minds these days, uh, the continuing war in Ukraine, um, you know, just uh, uh, one thing I'll mention, um, just yesterday, I had the opportunity to go up to uh, Lock Levin, the uh, disciples camp uh, here in, in Southern California. And um, uh, for those of you who know him, I, I went up there with Larry. Um, we had a, had a good time. Um, got to see um, some of the improvements they've done to the camp there. And uh, it was just a beautiful, it's also just a beautiful drive going up into the mountains. Um, and so I would, I would uh, ask your prayers for Lock 11. It's the Camp and Conference Center um, for the disciples in the, in the Pacific Southwest region, which actually includes um, Southern California, but also uh, Las Vegas and then uh, Hawaii. Um, so, um, and in, and in fact, found out that uh, the Arizona region was going to be sending a bunch of their children to um, Lock 11 or start doing that. So um, prayers for that. They'll be ramping up. Um, for a, a summer back after after a, quite a break here and uh, they'll be uh, coming back into summer camps uh, starting in I think late June or early July and then going through the summers so we'll be praying for the preparations uh, praying for the counselors and all the campers who will be going there that they will encounter God and um, and uh, have a good experience there in nature it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, Whatever is on your heart today, I want to lift that up as well. And maybe some of you are thinking about, you know, your mothers, of course, uh, or your children, if you are a mother. Um, you may be thinking about children you have who are now mothers of their own, um, or maybe even grandchildren who are mothers. Um, some of you. So as we come into this time of prayer, let us remember uh, all of God's people. As God's beloved people, let us pray for the church, the whole human family, and God's good creation. And before I begin the prayer, <laughs> uh, I want to invite you at several points through the prayer. I'll say, hear us, and then some description of God. And then the response, if you want to join me in it, is your mercy is great. So hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Your mercy is great. Okay. All right. Let us pray. We pray for women who are pregnant, those who are waiting with joyful expectation, and those who are filled with uncertainty and fear. We pray for women whose pregnancies are high risk and whose lives are in danger in the birthing process. Hear us, mothering God. Your mercy is great. We pray for women and men who long to be parents, but who struggle with infertility. Join their cries with those of Sarah and Abraham, Hannah and Elkanah, Elizabeth and Zacharias, that your will may be done in their lives. Hear us, God of life. Your mercy is great. 
We pray for women who are mothers, either by birth, by adoption, or through foster care. We pray that they may be supported in their mothering task by the men and other women in their lives, and that their children may be provided with sufficient food, shelter, and health care. Hear us, mothering Jesus. Your mercy is great. We pray for women who have lost children, either in utero, through sickness, through war and violence, or through tragic accident. Comfort them, Holy Spirit, with your everlasting presence and assure them of new life. Hear us, mothering Christ. Your mercy is great. We pray for women who are incarcerated, women who have been abusive, women who have been hurtful and neglectful. Hear us, mothering spirit. Your mercy is great. We pray for all women who give of themselves, not just through childbearing, but with their intellect, their skills, their gifts, and their physical abilities. Bless all women that may may receive equal compensation for their work, may be protected from abuse and harassment, and may be valued as unique individuals. Hear us, holy God. Your mercy is great. We pray for those who are transitioning, those who are seeking to understand God, who God has created them to be in their bodies, minds, and spirits. And they be, may they be protected from danger during their time of vulnerability and guided by those who love and support them. Hear us, holy God. Your mercy is great. We pray for women who strive to protect and advocate for those most vulnerable, children, the poor, God's creation, the disenfranchised, other women, and those men and women whose voices go unheard. Hear us, holy Jesus. Your mercy is great. We pray for those for whom this is a day of mourning and sadness for those who have lost mothers and other important women in their lives, that they may be comforted with the peace that passes all understanding. Hear us, comforting spirit. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for women who have been our mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, daughters, life partners, and friends. We give thanks for men who have mothered us with their own caring, affection, nurturing, and friendship. We lift to you now the names of those who have mirrored your mothering spirit, holy God. And now in silence, name those who you have been mothered by. Give them grace and bless them in their lives. Hear us, mothering God. Your mercy is great. For who else does the church pray today? For all those we name and for those who have no one to name them. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy God, we lift our prayers to you through the Holy Spirit in hope and trusting all for whom we pray to your great goodness and mercy made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And before we go to the special music, I want to acknowledge that this is a perhaps a particularly um, poignant Mother's Day for many of us, um, as the Supreme Court is considering um, potentially turning overturning uh, the Roe versus Wade decision that legalized abortion in the United States. Um, this touches up against motherhood, um, people's choices about whether to to carry children, um, and. Uh, it is a, it's, it's not a small thing at all. And I want to just acknowledge the sacredness of this, this discussion in this moment. Um, pregnancy, I personally have never experienced it, of course, um, but my wife has gone through it uh, twice and watching her 
through two pregnancies, one of which was particularly difficult, um, but both just really transforming her body and giving over a lot of its resources and its uh, abilities to nurture this tiny human. It's an amazing process and uh, one that is full of, of awe and uh, wonder at God's creation, but also one that takes a serious toll on a woman's body. And so I pray that we would keep that that tension and that wholeness of a woman's life in our prayers um, in this season. Let us enjoy the piece that Wes has written for all of us. Today's reading is from Proverbs 31, verses 10 through verse 31. A competent wife, how does one find her? Her value is far above pearls. Her husband entrusts his heart to her, and with her he will have all he needs. She brings him good and not trouble all the days of her life. She seeks out wool and flax. She works joyfully with her hands. She is like a fleet of merchant ships bringing food from a distance. She gets up while still at night, providing food for her household, even some for her female servants. She surveys a field and acquires it. 
From her own resources, she plants a vineyard. She works energetically. Her arms are powerful. She realizes that her trading is successful. She doesn't put out a lamp at night. She puts her hand to the spindle. Her palms grasp the world. She reaches out to the needy. She outstretches her hands to the poor. If she doesn't fear for her husband's household when it shows. Because they are all dressed in warm clothes. She makes bread spreads for herself. Fine linen and purple are her clothing. Her husband is known in the city gates when he sits with the elders of the land. She makes garments and sells them. She supplies sashes to traders. Her strength and honor are her clothing. She is confident about the future. Her mouth is full of wisdom. Kindly teaching is on her tongue. She is vigilant over the activities of her household. She doesn't eat the food of laziness. Her children bless her. Her husband praises her. Many women act competently, but you suppress them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Let her share in the results of her work. Let her deeds praise her in the city gates. Amen. So church, on this uh, Mother's Day, I'm sticking with our our uh, series on good news in the Old Testament, but I've jumped out of Genesis for now um, to focus on a passage about women, or about a woman at least. Um, this is the Proverbs 31 passage, and it's, it's a little infamous um, because it is used to, uh, or it has been used historically to hold up this really um, high view of what women are supposed to be and uh, used to reinforce some very uh, traditional kind of um, roles for women and so on. Um, but I want to look at it in, the, in, in its entirety and in the context of, of the chapter in which it's found. And, um, well, it's maybe not what folks have read it as often. Um, so this, it, this runs from uh, Proverbs 31, so the very end of Proverbs, from chapter, verses 10 through 31. And each of the lines, it's very interesting, this is uh, what's called an acrostic poem. And so each line begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So like the first line begins with Aleph, which is the first letter. Second one begins with Bey, third begins with Gimel, and then Dalit, Hey, and so on, through the Hebrew alphabet. Um, so one thing that means is that the structure is, it's not so much logical as it is artistic. Okay. So, uh, sometimes that it seems to kind of jump around topics a little bit and that's to accommodate this acrostic that they're trying to make. Right. It's like those things that you, you know, children do this too. You, you write, you know, mother down the side of the page on mother's day for mother's day, right? You mo write mother. And then it's like magnificent, uh, uh, omnipresent mom can, is everywhere. You can always see everything. Right. And then T, uh, uh, you know, whatever you come up with adjectives to describe your mom, right? It's that kind of thing. Um, just in Hebrew. So it doesn't look like that in English, but it does look that way in Hebrew. So again, so that's, you know, something about the, the structure of it. Um, it also means that the whole thing hangs together very tightly as a, as a poem. And when you look in here, um, there are the elements of why people read this in a very traditional way, right? It starts off a competent wife. Uh, often it's, it's translated a woman of valor or a wife of valor. How does one find her, right? Her value is above pearls. Her husband entrusts her heart to him, right? She brings him good and not trouble all the days of her life. She seeks out wool and flax, works joyfully with her hands, and you keep going down. Um, she gets up while it's still night, providing food for her household. Um, let's see, going on down. Puts her hand to the spindle. 
her palms grasp the whirl, right? These are all these very domestic tasks. She's doing all the food, you know, she's getting up before dawn to prepare the food for her family. She's making their clothes. Um, you know, the, it, she doesn't fear for her household when it snows because they're dressed in warm clothes. Like she makes sure everybody's taken care of. She makes bedspreads for herself, right? Uh, and so on. So you, you see, you can get this picture of a very traditional kind of uh, domestic woman who is, you know, doing all these things, getting up early to make sure her family is fed and that they have warm clothes and um, all this kind of thing. And so passages often use that way to kind of reinforce this very traditional view of a woman. Um, but that skips over quite a bit of what's in the poem, as I'll show you in a, in a minute. And it also skips over the context. So this is at the end of chapter 31. Well, what's at the beginning of chapter 31? It starts at verse 10. So there's nine verses before that. Well, what's before that is really interesting because it is the words, it's here in 31.1, it says, the words of King Lemu Lemuel of Massa, which his mother taught him. Okay, right. So the words of King Lemuel of Massa, and we don't know exactly who that is, which his mother taught him. So it's this king who has been taught by his mother, and, he's re and it's recounting the, the, what she taught him. So it's coming from a mother. Okay, so these are the words of the mother that she taught to her son. And it goes on to talk about, you know, uh, basically how a king should behave. And it talks about, you know, kings shouldn't get drunk. Uh, they don't want to forget the law and violate the rights of the needy. Um, you know, let the, let the poor drink and forget their poverty, but the king should stay sober so they can work out ju justice, speak on behalf of the voiceless, those who are vulnerable, uh, judge with righteousness, and so on. And this is what it's, this is what this mother is saying, Lemu Lemuel's mother is saying. Then we get to verse 10. And often people look at verse 10 to 31 as this separate thing, it's different. But there's nothing to indicate that we've moved on to another speaker, that we're in a different context. In the passage, it looks like this could just be a continuation of what King Lemuel's mother um, is telling him, okay? So that's one piece. Um, think about this as coming from a woman. A woman is saying this to her son, who happens to be a king, okay? So that really kind of, that in itself, I think, puts a different twist on this, a different flavor. If you think about it coming from a woman as advice for a king, okay? So think about it in those terms. Now we come to this first line, a competent wife or a woman of valor or however it's translated, right? The word there, it's eshet chayil. Eshet is just woman of or wife of. And, and the word in Hebrew is the same word. There is no separate word for wife or woman. It's the same word. Um, so you don't know which it is here. And then chayil, which is this word that, that um, it means like valor, it means power, it means uh, competence. It has to do with uh, ability, someone who is able. So a competent wife or a competent woman is a pretty good translation. Uh, the word is often actually used in military contests, contexts. Um, for valor and power and so on. So, so this is a strong, capable woman. It says, how does one find a strong, capable woman? And then it goes on and says, her value is above pearls, husband trusts her heart to her, you know, and so on. She brings him good, not trouble, the days of her life. And then starting in verse 13, it starts to describe some of the things that this woman does. Okay. And it includes those ones I mentioned earlier, right? She seeks out wool and flax. Um, she gets up at night preparing food for her family and so on. And she's making sure they're dressed warmly. So they go out in the cold and so on. But that's not all that it talks about here. In fact, right after it says, she seeks out wool and flax, works joyfully with her hands. Then it says, she is like a fleet of merchant ships bringing food from a distance. She gets up all this night providing food for her household, even 
some for her female servants. So not only is this woman getting up early and preparing food, she's also organizing it. She's figuring out where to get the different ingredients. She's making a plan, right? Okay, so this is, it's a little more involved. Then we get to verse 16 and things take quite a turn. She surveys a field and acquires it. From her own resources, she plants a vineyard. This is a radical statement, <laughs> right? In that patriarchal society, women did not survey fields and acquire them. They didn't plant vineyards. This was not the kinds of things women did traditionally, right? But actually, is it really? Well, there are instances of women in the Bible, in the Old Testament, um, seeking land and wealth. Um, in Numbers, when they get to the end of, they're toward the end of the uh, wilderness wanderings, right? And it's time to go into the land and divvy up the land for the different tribes and then the different families within the tribes, right? Each family, each clan is getting a piece of land. And these daughters, these women come to Moses. They're the daughters of Zelophehad. Say that five times fast, Zelophehad. Um, but they come to Moses and they say, you know, he, it, he doesn't have any sons to inherit the land. There's no males in the family to inherit this land. Let us inherit it so at least it stays in the family. And it won't, this family's not going to disappear from, from Israel. And after consulting the Lord, God says, yeah, they're right. They sh you should do that. And so these women, these daughters of Zelophehad, are given an inheritance of land, um, just the same as if they were sons, because they asked, right? It isn't just some radical thing that Moses came up with. This is something that the women asked for, and they said, this is only fair, right? There's no sons to inherit, but we're here. So let us do it. Um, you know, and there's some other examples of things like that. So this woman goes out and acquires a field and then plants a vineyard. Okay, let's see where it goes from here. She works energetically. Her arms are powerful. And I can't help but think of, um, when, it, especially the line, her arms are powerful. Um, if you've seen the film Encanto, it's the latest, one of the latest Disney uh, animated things. And I think her name's Louisa, is one of the sisters of the main character. And she, her thing is that she's super strong. And so she's this woman who's just super strong. And they, and they end up kind of um, unpacking that a bit in the film. And it's very, it's fascinating um, what they do with that. But I can't think of, help but think of her, right? Her, she works energetically. Her arms are powerful. Yeah, it's Louisa. She's like you know, carrying boulders and, you know, whatever. Um, but then it says she realizes her trading is successful. She doesn't put out her lamp at night. So this is someone involved in business. Uh, but then, of course, she puts her hand to the spindle. Her palms grasp the whirl. But this is a great contrast here, or comparison, verses 19 and 20. In 19, it says she puts her hand to the spindle, right? She sends out her hand to the spindle, and her palms grasp the world, right? Then in the very next verse in 20, it says her palm, her, her again, her palm reaches out to the needy. She stretches out her hands to the poor. And it, it's, it's a play here because it says it uses hands, then palms, then palms, then hands. And you, you, you don't get that in every translation, but it's there. It says, basically, she puts her hands to the spindle. Her palms grasp the whirl. Her palms reach out to the needy. And her hands, she stretches out her hands to the poor. And so it's putting the, it's drawing a comparison or connection between her domestic activities and caring for the poor, which is this thing that she's doing as well. She doesn't fear for her household when it snows. Okay, of course, she makes bread spreads and all that. Then it says, her husband is known in the city gates when he sits down with the elders of the land. So her husband is important and he's known, right? And the city gate was the place where you would go to you know, chew the fat. Uh, it was also a place where you'd settle disputes and things like that. So she makes garments and sells them 
So this working at the spindle and the whirl and all isn't just for her family, but she's uh, selling sashes to traders. She's um, industrious. She's, she's, you know, it's like Lydia in the New Testament, right? In Book of Acts, you have this woman, Lydia, who sells purple fabrics. Similar to that. Strength and honor, her, her clothing, she's confident. Her mouth is full of wisdom and so on. Um, and then, then it gets down to verse 28. And her children bless her. Her husband praises her. Many women act competently. This, this term again, chayil. But you surpass them all. Um, and then it ends here with charm is deceptive, beauty fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So it seems to indicate that all of these characteristics above, the, the domestic and the, the business acumen and the strength and the, you know, all these different things that this woman has expressed are not charm and beauty because those things fleet but it says a woman who fears the lord is to be praised and it it seems to indicate that the woman who acts this way who does these things these kinds of things is demonstrating her fear of the lord and then the very last bit let her share in the results of her work let her deeds praise her in the city gates. Women did not go to the city gates. I mean, they went through them, obviously, but they wouldn't go sit at the city gate because that's, again, the place of the men, the leaders, and the, and the judges. Um, but then it says, you know, let her share, give to her. Uh, literally says, like, give to her from the fruit of her hands and praise her in the city gates. This is um, kind of a superwoman, right? She's done everything. Um, it reminds me of this this um, commercial from um, whatever decade. <laughs> um, uh, I bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan. You know, it, it was, I looked it up. It was for a perfume, I guess. Um, but it's based on a, a song by Peggy Lee, uh, Ain't, uh, I'm a Woman. And in her song, actually, it was all about these domestic, mostly, not entirely, but it's largely a, a lot of domestic things. And then they did it in this commercial, and it's drawing this contrast, right? I can bring home the bacon and fry it up in a pan. It's like, I can do everything. And this was this image of this kind of superwoman, right? Um, and more recent feminists are kind of mm, pushing back on that a bit, this idea that we have to do everything Um you know, but what this what this poem is giving us is a picture of what a woman can be, and it's not this traditional limited role that society for millennia has wanted to place on women. But it recognizes that women have wisdom and knowledge, and they can do business. They can go out and acquire fields. They can plant vineyards. They can start businesses. Right. Um, in fact, in the developing world, one of the things that has been found to really help with development in, in those areas is to make micro loans. So these are loans that are, um, you know, a few hundred dollars or a thousand, you know, usually no more than not much more than that, um, for people to start up like small businesses and things in developing nations. And they've found that the biggest effects have come from giving microloans to women because the women will take these microloans and they will use them wisely. They'll use them well. They come up with businesses that, that work and the default rates on the loans is incredibly low. The, the repayment loans or uh, repayment rates from what I remember is are well over 90%. So um, it's also a good investment business wise, but women being the ones who can, who can really, uh, you know, drive things. So, uh, so on this mother's day, uh, let us remember that women are created by God and that a woman who fears the Lord, a woman who pays attention to God, who listens to God can be a woman who does all kinds of things. It can be someone who, you know, runs her home well. It could be someone who runs a business well. It could be someone who 
buys fields, who deals in real estate and property, someone who's investing and uh, gaining. It's not a limited view of what a woman can be. And uh, it's kind of amazing actually coming out of this context where it's a very patriarchal traditional culture. But remember that these are the words of the king's mother. <laughs> the king's mom is saying, you know what, son, you as a king need to remember that women can do all these things. And that by doing that, they can actually be fearing the Lord. So let's pray. God, thank you for all the powerful women in our lives. Um, let their abilities shine forth, not as a burden, not as something to live up to or to aspire to, God, but let these words give encouragement um, that women can do and act in so many different realms in your name. And uh, we give you thanks for that. In the name of your son, Jesus, Amen. And now as we prepare to come to Christ's table, um, we're going to sing together, The Voice of Jesus Calls His People. So uh, as we prepare ourselves to come to Christ's table, let us sing. Welcome to Christ's Table. In this season after Easter, we celebrate resurrection. We affirm new life and we look forward to life beyond life. As we come to this table, we are reminded, however, of what it took to get there. The pain, the suffering, the horror. And so we know that from pain and suffering can come new life. And that is what we remember at Christ's table. On that night so long ago, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. Baruch Adonai, olam, haaretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. And then he took a cup, and again he gave thanks. Baruch Adonai, Elohim Alech HaOlam, Borei HaGafen, Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. And I tell you the truth, I won't drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The body of Christ broken for us.
the blood of Christ shed for us. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God, for the people of God. Our hymn of invitation today is Woman Weeping in the Garden. And this, uh, this song pulls together a couple streams here. It, it brings us, uh, continues us in our Easter tide, our post Easter time, um, as this song reflects on the woman going to the tomb and her experiences there. But also it, uh, it, it partakes in this uh, celebration of womanhood and motherhood. Um, that we're that we're uh, doing today. So, as we sing, this is our opportunity to commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to the God who nurtures us um, and brings us brings us uh, goodness and life through strong women figures in our lives. So, let us sing. now as we go, may the risen Christ be above us to watch over us. May Christ be beneath us to lift us up. May Christ be ahead of us to lead us. May Christ be behind us to push us. May Christ be beside us to walk with us. And may Christ be within us to love us forever. Amen.